business news and will be telling us about plans by the CBN to revive the textile sector. You first. First Bank. Thank you, Melinda. Indeed, we'll begin with the central bank commencing the distribution of high-yielding cotton seeds to some 1,000 farmers cultivating over 200,000 hectares of farmland across the Federation. Governor, the Governor, Godwin MFLA, notes that the move has become very necessary in order to address the insufficient cotton seeds, which remains one of the biggest challenges facing cotton farmers in Nigeria. The cotton and textile industry reforms is coming with extensive training and proper farming techniques with expectations of high yields of up to four tons per hectare. The program is implemented in partnership with the National Cotton Association of Nigeria with hopes that farmers will comply with the stipulated terms of support. The Nigeria Bank Settlement System reports that the financial industry incurred an actual loss of two billion naira in the 2018 fiscal year with the mobile channel recording the highest volume of loss, valued at 598.8 million naira. At a meeting of the Nigerian Electronic Fraud Forum, the central bank called for concerted efforts by all players in the financial industry to curtail future occurrence. Now a total of 9.3 billion naira has been approved as dividend for shareholders of First Bank Holdings PLC at 26 cobalt per share. The amount was approved during the company's seventh annual general meeting, which was held right here in Lagos. In presenting its performance for the year 2018, the board of FBN Holdings says that it has made significant strides in strengthening its hold in the electronic banking space through the launch of the agent banking program that has now grown to over 15,000 agents. The 2019 annual general meeting of FBN Holdings comes on the heels of its 125th anniversary, a major milestone for a company of African heritage. <laughs> Business of the day is to receive the accounts for 2018 with the reports of directors, auditors and other relevant committees. During the year in review, FBN Holdings saw a growth in total assets by 6.3% from 5.2 trillion naira in 2017 to 5.6 trillion naira in 2018, while customer deposits expanded by 10.9% from 3.1 trillion naira to 3.5 trillion naira. Profit after tax grew from 37.7 to 59.7 billion naira. However, there was a slight decline in gross earnings. We are sensitive to all our stakeholders, particularly our shareholders, who have had to pick you know, the brunt of the um, challenges that the economy gave us um, when we had you know, that decline in the price of oil. Now, of course, we've learned quite a lot of lessons, whereas we will encourage diversification, definitely we will avoid concentration. We've made significant investment in our e-business, and that's electronic and banking business, and we're beginning to reap the fruit of those investments, so we recorded significant growth in that area. We've also invested a lot in our transaction banking. Um, we've also seen quite some uh, decent growth in that space. But more importantly, we've curtailed the level of impairment charges. So those key factors contributed to the quantum growth that you have seen in the bottom line. Accordingly, shareholders are rewarded with a dividend of over 90 billion naira. We perused every aspect of the result and we are very hopeful that if they are able to recover some of the provisions already made, we'll get out of the bracket of 20 cobalt and all this and that. We move into the bracket of naira. The group says it is resolute about delivering on its strategic objectives for the year and working to ensure that it creates shareholder value and builds strong foundations for the future. Well, let's go to the equities market, which has already started the week on a bearish note as the benchmark index contracted by 0.05% to 29,196.87 points, driven by sell off across industrial goods and the banking sectors. Ikaite Afia has the details. Hello, 
and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Monday's trading session at the Nigerian equities market saw the all-share close in the negative territory due to bargain hunting by short-term investors. The headline index shed 0.05%, plunging into the 29,000 level with the equity capitalization at 10.97 trillion naira. The insurance sector took the shine on Monday with a 2.35% gain, unlike the banking and industrial goods counter, which shed 0.68 and 0.53% each. On the activity chart, 271.07 million shares worth 1.38 billion naira were traded over 3,000 deals. Shares of Japal Oil, UBA, and Courtville were the most actively traded. The market is highly unpredictable, but let's see what the week holds. That's the Stock Market Report. I'm Akaita Afia. Thank you, Kaite. The African markets have continued to record low performance despite expectations that U.S. Fed's dovish decision at last week's meeting will change the narrative. Here are some of the figures after the day's business. With those bearish figures, we'll end business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Wawado. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Melinda. You first. First bank. Many thanks, Anne. South Africa's political parties held their final campaign rallies this weekend ahead of Wednesday's national and provisional elections. Diaspora votes had been cast in April, while special votes of those who will be on essential duty on D-Day have been cast today. Nigeria's former president, Dr. Goodluck Jonathan, who is among international election observers, is already in South Africa for the elections. Our Johannesburg bureau chief, Betty Debia, has this report. Usual rhetoric, electoral promises and scorecards of those who have tasted office. Every party colour made a showing at their chosen arena across the country. Of the best municipalities in the country, 15 of them out of the 20 are run by the TA. Amanda! government of tomorrow. We are going to be the government after the eighth by Atanda, Noma Batandi. Now is the time. Vote ANC. All the parties had it all worked out how to reform the economy and the politics, land expropriation, fighting corruption, providing free education, tackling illegal immigration, and restoring every citizen's dignity. We asked political experts what they made of the speeches. Well, I think uh, there's a uh, promises that are doable and some are just outright uh, nonsensical. For parties that will never govern, they can always make as much claims on what they can do, precisely because they know they won't be responsible. This Monday, special votes are being cast across the country by those like the police, IEC officers, or even journalists who would be busy on May the 8th. That includes you. You're both right. <laughs> on the streets, we ask some what they're expecting their votes to accomplish. These people are the same people who told like ANC or they're going to make a difference. But if you look at things, they're still the same. Right now, I'm conflicted. I like the ideologies of the EFF, but then I find that Jules Malema is too radical for me. So it's a thing of, would I risk it or should I just 
stick to like the smaller parties. I'm not sure if they can keep their promises, but if they can, then I'm definitely sure that South Africa is going to be doing quite awesome. National and provincial elections will take place on Wednesday the 8th, and this will be coming 25 years after the first multiracial vote in South Africa in 1994, from which global icon Nelson Mandela emerged as the first black president of the country. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. 58 people are now known to have died after an overtank tanker exploded near the airport in Niger's capital, Niamey. Many of the victims had gathered to collect fuel after the vehicle overturned close to the rail tracks as it tried to park. 37 others were also injured in that accident. Let's get a wrap of the international news now. Juliana Olainka is standing by with Around the World in Five. Good evening from the Channel's newsroom in London. The Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, has given birth to a baby boy, Prince Harry has announced. <laughs> Meghan went into labour in the early hours of the morning, Buckingham Palace said in a statement. The new arrival is the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's first child. Prince Harry told reporters the couple were both absolutely thrilled and thanked the public for their support during the pregnancy. We're both absolutely thrilled. Um, and so grateful to all the love and support for everybody out there, um, from everybody out there. It's been, um, it's been amazing. The infant is seventh in line to the throne and weighs seven pounds and three ounces. Now the bodies of all those who died when a Russian plane crash-landed have been recovered. That's according to authorities. 41 people died in total, including two children. 78 people were on board the Sukhoi Superjet when a fire broke out mid-flight. Early reports from passengers suggest it could have been hit by lightning. Simon Pusey reports. It's the stuff of nightmares. Terrifying footage of a passenger plane landing with a massive fire on board. Thick plumes of black smoke billowing from the tail. Horrified passengers filmed the ordeal from the terminal. 37 people on board survived. Here you can see some of them fleeing the plane, jumping out of the emergency chutes and running for their lives. 41 people died, but from the scenes of the wreckage today, it's amazing it wasn't more. The charred shell of the plane, now the site of an investigation into the incident. Flight tracking websites show the route the plane took, circling twice over Moscow before making the emergency landing. The same model was involved in a crash seven years ago. In May 2012, the Sukhoi Superjet 100 came down in the West Java province of Indonesia, killing all 45 people on board. Russia's transport minister says there's no reason to ground the Sukhoi models at this stage. Reports from passengers and crew suggest the plane may have been struck by lightning. But many questions remain about why a short domestic flight could end in such tragedy. Simon Pusey, Channels Television News. In Libya, Khalifa Haftar has promised to step up his offensive against the country's UN-backed government. His spokesperson said Haftar's Libyan National Army would battle harder than ever to take the capital Tripoli. It comes just hours after the UN called for a week-long truce following a month of fighting for the capital that has displaced 50,000 people. The U.S. has deployed an aircraft carrier to the Middle East to send a clear and unmistakable message to Iran. The deployment of the warship was based on claims of a possible attack on U.S. forces. That's according to the Reuters news agency. The U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton said the decision was in response to a number of troubling and escalatory indications and warnings. India's Prime Minister has said he'll be releasing a further $144 million in relief to rebuild after Cyclone Fani. Narendra Modi also conducted an aerial survey of Odisha State, the worst hit province, and held a review meeting with the state's chief. The money is in addition to the $55 million announced before the storm hit. At least 33 people were killed and hundreds of thousands left homeless by the cyclone which had winds of up to 200 kilometres per hour. One million species are at risk of extinction. That's according to the UN. 
The stark warning comes ahead of a landmark report on the damage done by modern civilization to the natural world. Known as the Global Assessment, it found that up to one million of the world's estimated eight million plant, insect and animal species is at risk of extinction, many within decades. And finally, across the globe, Muslim worshippers have gathered to mark the beginning of Ramadan. Here, worshippers attended prayers in Indonesia's Iskital Mosque in the capital, Jakarta, to mark the occasion. During this holy month, observers will abstain from food and drink during daylight hours for up to 30 days. Ramadan fasting will end with Eid al-Fitr celebrations, an important religious holiday that is also a time for forgiveness and making amends. And that's your international news around the world in five. Many thanks, Juliana. Still ahead on the news at 10, it's now down to eight schools as the quest to qualify for the finals of the China's International Kids Cup intensifies. That's on Sports News. Join us again. <laughs>